this. Okay, um, we dropped two test questions. So the class average was 81%, so good job. I know there was some confusion of what was out there. Hopefully the blueprint helped. Um, we will have those blueprints posted by Wednesday afternoons. So sometimes we have class and then we have simulation. And so by the time we look at the test, it's been Wednesday morning. So we'll have those posted to you by Wednesday afternoon um, so that you've got those to study with. There will be a couple of mixed units. A couple of them have a couple of different units on the exam. But for the most part, by the time we hit um, here in a couple of weeks, it'll be one unit per exam. And that'll cut out some of the confusion, I think, too. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, a couple of things. Har uh, for the pediatric cardiac presentations, um, in the first module, let me see if I can share my screen here with you. And I'll go to... All right, I can't ever see the chat once I go into screen share. So if you guys can't, if somebody could enable their mic and tell me, yes, you can see this module. We can see it. Okay, perfect. So up here under the, the basic course information one, there is the guidelines for presentation and handout. That'll give you some guidance for any of the presentations. Then if you have a pediatric cardiac heart anomaly, if you come down here to um, sensory respiratory, right here, cardiac system, we have pediatric cardiac presentation guidelines. This will give you more guidance for those particular um, presentations because they're pretty unique. Also, right here, if you look at the online reading, this is in place of your book, because your book doesn't go into depth very well on a lot of these heart anomalies. So we've got a different book that we've pulled this reading from. Use this to guide you for your presentations. It's a good jumping off point to get you going. And then also make sure that you read it, even if you don't have one of those presentations, because there will be some test questions from it. And this is just the reference. We have to have that for our accreditation on there. We will post under the PowerPoints here, there will be several, um, several different PowerPoints and I'll guide you along as we go. Um, but all of those will come up with cardiac. So I just wanted to kind of cue you in on the reading assignment and on those guidelines, because there were a couple of people that are working on their presentations for that, and I wanted to make sure you knew where to look. Um, okay, we'll go back to seeing this. Um, the PEDS simulation preparation worksheet is due next Wednesday, the 23rd, by 11.59. That's the one that you need to have to be prepared for pediatric simulation on Thursday. Make sure you look at your list and see if you're coming in the morning on Thursday or the afternoon. And then everyone will be um, online or um, it'll actually probably be a Zoom conference for that Friday the 25th in the morning. Um, when I have a guest speaker, it's a little bit easier to navigate Zoom than it is to navigate Blue Button because most of them already know how to do Zoom. So we will get you a link here in just the next few days or at least first of next week to be able to do that's only Friday morning. Thursday is in person here with your masks and face shields. Um, let's see here. Okay, and then there's a seizure video. So it is, I had an in-class simulation to go with our seizure discussion today, but we can't do it because you're not here. And so I videoed, had our um, videographer come and do um, an online one. And so it's posted in your modules. It is, um, I'll tell you the title of it. Yep, 
It's just pediatric seizure simulation. You don't have to do anything with it other than just watch it. Um, and then when you watch it, it just kind of gives you an indication of how to take care of a patient. You can see what we've talked about. Um, sometimes that helps. I'm a real visual person and a kind of a, and a kinesthetic learner. So I have to see it and kind of put my hands on it to really wrap my brain around it. So just one more way for you to be able to um, uh, look at this stuff and be able to learn it. Okay, so let's get started. I have a joke for you because I love to do that before every class. So this one is about um, a guy that moves from North Dakota to Florida. And when he moves there, he tries to go get a job at a big box store, kind of like Costco, and but it's commission sales. And so his um, his boss said, well, you know, do you have any sales experience? And he said, um, yeah, actually, I was a door-to-door -door vacuum salesman in North Dakota. And he said, you know, Florida is kind of a whole different ball game, but we'll give you a shot. After his first day, he comes down and he says, how did it go? And he said, well, I, I only had one sale. And he said, gosh, I don't know if you're going to be able to hang in there. And he said, but it was worth $101,463. And he said, what the heck did you sell? And he said that there was this guy looking at fishing hooks. And I said, well, if you're going to go fishing, probably need a, a rod and reel. And so I sold him a fishing pole. And then I asked him where he was going to go fishing. And he said, out on the lake. And I said, well, then you're probably going to need a boat. And so I sold him a boat. And then he said, well, I don't really have anything to pull it with. And so I sold him a truck. And he said, you mean to tell me some guy came in here for a fishing pole and you sold him a boat and a truck? And he said, oh, no, he came in here for tampons. And I said, buddy, your weekend shot. Go fishing. <laughs> Good reason to take off and go fishing, huh? <laughs> All right. So we've got um, what we'll do today. Our goal will be thank you, Hannah and Jade, and I love it. <laughs> So we are going fishing. You bet, Stephanie. We're going fishing for information, neuro information. But I do know some good fishing holes. So if you are a fisherman, let me know. All right. So pediatric neurology, we're going to start first with our objectives here. Um, the objectives for the pediatric portion are 4, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And 17 is kind of going off my page there. I'm wondering if I, oh, but it's still kind of going off my page. All right, so um, number four is identify clinical manifestations and therapeutic interventions for patients with TBIs. Now you talked, um, the other adult portion talks in depth about TBIs. This piece is only going to be a couple of pediatric concerns that go with TBIs. It's like two or three slides is all. So it won't um, build a lot on what you've talked about, just a few pediatric considerations. Number 13, compare the clinical manifestations and medical management of a child experiencing meningitis and encephalitis. 14, compare the clinical manifestations and medical management of patients experiencing various neurodegenerative disorders. And these are going to be um, uh, the pediatric pieces of that. So I know Vicki covers some of that also. Uh, 15, compare the clinical manifestations and medical management of patients experiencing various types of seizures. 16, identify seizure precautions. And 17, compare the clinical manifestations and it goes off the page. <laughs> so I'm, I can't really, um, I can't read the very bottom one there. So let's see if I can no, it doesn't go, it doesn't go any smaller for me. So hopefully you can see the bottom of that. Um, if not, you can look at the, the one that I posted. All right, let's see here. Some of the, try to keep up with the chat here. Therapeutic interventions for a child with cerebral palsy. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. <laughs> All right, for PEDS Neuro Assessment, PEARLS. These are some things that I want you to remember about neurology and kids. Stop, look, and listen. They really will tell you a lot if you just watch them. If they stop eating or playing, that's a big red flag. Kids like to eat. They like to play. 
even if they're a picky eater, they still like their chicken nuggets and mac and cheese or whatever it is. They're kind of locked on for that moment. Um, know your baselines. So think about your baseline um, assessments and then ask your parents what's normal for this patient and be able to go from there. Primitive reflexes um, should be gone by 12 to 14 months or it's a big red flag. Generally, 12 months. But if that Babinski's kind of hanging on a little bit, they don't get too concerned until about 13 or 14 months. So if you still have a startle reflex and they're six or eight months old, then that's a problem. That's a neurological delay and something that needs to be reported to a physician. Neuroassessments. So the difference between adults and kids are these three things. So you would do a baseline neuroassessment, and then you would add fontanelles, an OFC, that's an occipital frontal circumference. So it goes right here, around the front, around the occiput, and you measure it with a tape measure. So that's your OFC. And then their reflexes. So those three things are unique to a pediatric patient. You should always check your fontanelles in what position. What position should your child be in? Sitting up. Woo-woo. Good job. Yep, exactly. They should always be sitting up. All right, so first we're going to talk about seizures. Um, seizure, by definition, is just a sudden abnormal discharge of neurons in the cerebral cortex. And that alters some function or behavior. So a seizure disorder, sometimes we think of it as um, a large diagnosis. A lot of people that might have um, epilepsy, but only about half to 1% of kids have a seizure disorder. And so um, less than a third percent or less than a third of patients are actually um, have a diagnosis of epilepsy. About 90% of the seizures last less, last less than one to two minutes long. And most of them are caused by external influences, not by a diagnosis of epilepsy. So your seizure causes can be genetics. Um, you might have, they might have a parent that has seizures and they've inherited that. A head trauma, fever, we'll talk specifically about febrile seizures. That's pretty common in little kids, and it's usually just one, sometimes maybe two. Missed medications or dosing changes. So kids that have epilepsy that are on a medication, a maintenance medication to keep those at bay, um, if they miss it or if they're vomiting and they throw up their medication. Kids' doses are dosed milligrams per kilogram, and so if they grow and they get heavier, they can potentially outgrow their dose. So maybe it was on 10 kilos and now they weigh, they've gone to 12 to 15 to 18 and now all of a sudden they're having breakthrough seizures. So they'll reevaluate those doses. Any toxic ingestions that might end up causing a seizure, hypo or hyperglycemia, tumors or lesions that might be in the brain, Anoxia or hypoxia, so if they have a child that has had an anoxic brain injury, um, maybe it was a near drown, and now they're having seizures. Any congenital malformations, sometimes if they have microcephaly where they have a really small head, then they can end up having um, a seizure disorder also. Um, a stroke, sometimes uh, preemies will end up with an intracranial bleed just after birth, and um, some of them can end up having a seizure disorder too. Any infections like meningitis or sepsis, and those would be self-limiting. So those would happen while they were sick, but wouldn't generally continue into a full-blown seizure disorder once the meningitis or the sepsis has cleared up. Any drug abuse can cause seizures, and then sometimes they're just idiopathic. They're not really sure why or where it's coming from, but that they are having seizures. Now this slide's in green, and it's because these things will cause a seizure if they have a known and diagnosed seizure disorder. So they won't in and of themselves cause a seizure, or a lot of us are in trouble. 
So if you have a seizure disorder, if your child that um, you're taking care of has a seizure disorder, stress can bring on a seizure, lack of sleep, and then photosensitivity. So if they are around flashing lights, whether it's on a video game or in a, um, in a uh, dance hall or whatever, where they happen to have some flashing lights, then that can end up causing a seizure also. So just remember the other two slides were anybody and these are people who currently have a seizure disorder. Tonic-clonic seizures are the ones that we think of the most when we talk about seizures. Those are full-blown upper and lower body movement. Tonic is when the muscles stiffen, and so their little arms can get like straight like this or like down to their side. And clonic is when the muscles spasm or jerk. So um, they used to be called grand mal seizures um, in French. That's big bad. So that kind of wasn't something, I guess, that they wanted to keep calling it. And they decided it was more descriptive and helpful to families and people they were teaching to call it what it is. So they're tonic-clonic. They can have an onset at any age, but often it's as a child. And so that's why we're talking about it with our pediatric unit. Uh, many times they'll have an aura and the aura is where it's kind of a warning. So some people have said like, I always smell something sweet before I have a seizure or there are lights that flash or my vision gets really um, dark on the periphery, almost like how a migraine would be described with vision changes. Some people get tingling in their right hand and then they have a seizure just shortly after. These are really helpful because it helps get them out of dangerous situations if they have an aura. So if they um, have tingling in their right hand and they're walking along the sidewalk, then they can sit down or even lay down and then they don't risk falling like they would if they start to have a seizure. Um, these are often less um, than about one to two minutes and we'll talk about what, what it's called and what happens when it's not. And they will have urinary or bowel incontinence. Oh, geez, Kylie. Her first seizure when she was on a motorcycle. I hope she's okay. That would be a scary, that would be a scary, scary thing. For sure, for sure. Um, but she likes to tell the story. <laughs> Sometimes those make good stories. I'm glad she's okay. Um, urinary and bowel incontinence. So they will often have urinary incontinence, but not always bowel. Um, it, the longer the seizure goes, the, the higher the likelihood is that they'll have bowel incontinence. Um, they can cry or make kind of a grunting sound. And the grunting sound is that tonic um, or like tightening of the diaphragm. And that diaphragm muscle kind of tightens down and makes it a little bit difficult to breathe. And so they will grunt sometimes. They'll have very slow, shallow breathing or apnea. And they'll turn blue pretty quickly if they have, if they're apneic. And so we'll talk about some of the, the treatments that go along with that. Um, the postictal phase follows that. And that is a phase of recovery. Uh, a little bit later on, more into tomorrow, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I won't, but we have a student presentation on care of a patient in the tonic-clonic phase, so I won't steal their thunder. Um, I have a video of a tonic-clonic patient, so let me share my screen. Please tell me um, when you see this, hopefully if you see this. <laughs> Do you guys see tonic-clonic seizure there? You can see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, how right here? How right here? Just need to do this for the, for the doctor. That's right. Lay down. You can't see it right here. Right here. Right here. Okay. 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 
Okay. You can see at the beginning how her little arms were really straight and really tonic, and then her legs um, were kind of shaking. So I, I love it how her mom says, stay on the bed, <laughs> because there is no way she could control that. So you would have to make sure that you could keep them safe. And if they were to start to fall off the bed, you wouldn't pull them or hold them onto the bed because those muscles are so tight. Um, that you can end up breaking bones if you restrain them in any way. So the best thing to do would be just to kind of cradle them down to the floor. All right. Um, absence seizures. These are seizures that are kind of like daydreamy, staring off in space kind of thing. Um, sometimes parents don't um, catch that and school teachers do. Let's see, what is the reason they have bowel and urinary incontinence? Um, just that loss of consciousness. Um, they'll lose consciousness with tonic-clonic seizures, and then they can end up losing urinary um, continence. And, and like I said, bowel incontinence isn't quite as common unless they go longer. But you also have um, that tonic tightening of the muscle, um, can affect smooth muscle too, and so it can affect some um, muscle in the gut and in the and in the bladder, and so that may be some of it also. Hopefully that helps, Megan. Okay, um, these are rarely greater than ten seconds, and they kind of stare, but they don't fall, and they just have the cessation of their activity or their speech. So they might just kind of like stare off into space and then come right back to what they're doing. But sometimes they need to be a little bit reoriented um, as to what they were doing and what was going on. Uh, their mouth or limbs might twitch just a little bit. Uh, they don't usually remember. So sometimes they're a little embarrassed if people are like, what did you do or what just happened? And, and they don't really remember, um, but they didn't fully lose consciousness. They just kind of have that little lapse um, of about 10 seconds. Um, they can pick up where they left off. Sometimes they need to be reoriented, like if they were coloring and then they just stopped and kind of just stared and then they kind of came back to it and they'll look at you like, well, what happened? And you can say, well, you were coloring and then they'll go right back to what they were doing. Um, some of them can occur many times a day. Sometimes their eyes will roll or flutter and often it decreases or stops with adolescence. And I have an absence seizure one here too. Are 
can water go out of the pool though, honey. Right, Haley? 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 Okay, so that's a little bit um, about what an absence seizure looks like. And infantile spasms, they, let's see, they were so subtle and quick, you almost couldn't tell. Yeah, exactly. They are a little bit hard to tell, and so it isn't sometimes that they really get caught until they're into a position where they really need to focus, and a teacher might be working with them as a preschooler or something, and then they kind of pick up on that a little bit more. Infantile spasms are very similar to a tonic-clonic seizure. They indicate a cerebral defect because the onset is usually um, 3 to 12 months. There's um, often an accompanying developmental delay and other neurological problems, like maybe they still have lingering reflexes, maybe they're not making other milestones, and they start to regress. They usually have a pretty poor prognosis as far as um, being on track for development or even really having a lot of meaningful interaction because of these seizures that start so early. They can't always pinpoint um, what has caused them, but if they start under a year old, then they generally are worse off as far as development goes. Atonic or akinetic seizures are also called drop attacks. And so they could be just walking along, let's see where my camera is, walking along <laughs> and just fall. And they just drop to the ground, just like a rock. Um, so sudden loss of tone, they just collapse and then they regain consciousness after a few seconds um, or minutes, but minutes really not plural. Usually it's more, it's closer to, um, to seconds. And then these guys will often need a helmet for safety because they do just fall and collapse so quick without any warning. Um, let's go back here. I have a little video. Okay. These kids, um, if they have a tonic or drop attack type seizures, they often will have another kind of seizure. So whether it's um, absence, whether it's a myoclonic seizure that we'll talk about in a second, whether they have um, tonic-clonic seizures, but often it's accompanied by another kind. Myoclonic seizures are just a sudden um, brief involuntary muscle jerk. And it's often arms and legs, and it's commonly one side. So it might just be an arm, might be an arm and a leg. It can occur once or it can occur several times, <laughs> usually in a day. So it can occur once in a day or several times. 
these guys don't have any level of consciousness changes. And it usually, sometimes it just is like a little muscle twitch. Um, and so it isn't picked up on real soon because people don't always just notice a muscle twitch unless it's a little bit bigger, more like a muscle jerk. And it very seldom crosses, crosses midline. And so it'll be same side, arm and leg or just arm. If it starts to cross, then often you'll have tonic-clonic seizures because that impulse is moving um, both sides of the brain and it can cause more seizures than just the myoclonic seizures. This little video here has a link. I couldn't get it for some reason to load, but um, if you look and see, then this will give you an idea of a myoclonic seizure. Febrile seizures um, are the most common type in young kids, probably because little kids get sick with just about everything, right? Um, let's see. He should get a custom paint job on his helmet. <laughs> yeah, he should. That would be that would be great. And Jessica, I used to do EEGs, and we had a patient with this kind that manifests with uncontrollable laughing. That is kind of awesome. <laughs> I would just need them to follow me around for when I tell a joke, and then I would just have this kid that would just be uncontrollably laughing, and it would be amazing. Um, okay, let's see here. So febrile seizures, the most common type because kids that get sick get sick often, and they end up having um, fevers that either go up quickly or go really high. Adults don't often get fevers um, as often as kids. So this, the research says they occur as a result of rapid temperature rise or by a lot, which seems like really counterintuitive to good research by saying by a lot. But what they mean is they used to say it was how fast it went, how fast it rose. It didn't matter where it stopped. It was just how fast the temperature rose. And then other, and then the research kind of swung the other way and said, no, it's actually how high it goes. Um, and, and over a certain amount is, is more prone to seizures. But then as they continue to do more research, they realized that both can be causal agents. And so you might have a kiddo whose temperature just went up really quick. Or you have a kiddo who didn't go up really fast, but maybe it ended at like 103 and they've just been running this really high temperature. Um, kids in the six month to three year range are common and um, it most commonly occurs in the 12 to 24 months old. Those kids have ear infections. Um, sometimes they have a lot of trouble with strep throat, um, but often those darn ear infections can be a cause of uh, febrile seizures because their fever is going up and down and up and down when they have those. Um, they must rule out underlying infections like meningitis or sepsis. So if a kiddo comes in, they have a fever, then they're going to look in their ears, they're going to look in their throat, they might do a urine catch to see if they can get, um, to see white blood cell count in the urine, and um, or they might do a, a straight cath for that. And then if they can't find any cause, something that might be causing this fever, and they'll probably do um, a lumbar puncture or spinal tap um, to be able to see if they have meningitis or if they have any other reason to make them think that they're going septic. So clinical manifestations, they have a fever. Um, it lasts less than one to two minutes and it's tonic clonic in nature. They often have a family history of febrile seizures, um, but not always. And it often occurs once in 24 hours. However, once it's occurred, it has a 30% chance of reoccurring in the same 24 hours. Um, the patient needs further evaluation. If the seizure is over three minutes, if it occurs on only one side of the body, so if they have a tonic-clonic type seizure, but it's only on one side of the body, then sometimes that can indicate that there's a brain tumor um, or a lesion or something that's causing problems on one side of the brain. 
and if they've had more than one seizure in 24 hours. These would be reasons that they need to um, be followed up on. Treatment of febrile seizures. So anti-seizure medications are rarely given. These aren't seizures that are ongoing, so those aren't medications that need to be, that need to be given. You need to give antipyretics early. You need to get those on board. A lot of other treatments take longer. Testing takes longer. And so we need to make sure we get antipyretics on board. Um, they treat the underlying illness as opposed to giving them anti-seizure medications. So we treat the ear infection, um, strep throat, whatever it may be with antibiotics and get them feeling better so that they don't keep having a fever. A tepid bath, not too warm, not too cold. It's just kind of right in the middle there. And it can be a little on the cool side, but if you are educating family members when they go home, make sure you tell them if the child starts to shiver to get them out and get them dry and just put light clothing on them like a onesie and a diaper or something like that, a t-shirt and a diaper. That way um, they don't start to warm themselves back up because if they're shivering, that's the body's way of warming them up. And then ice packs to the armpits or the groin, not super comfortable, but often they're sick enough or they're not feeling they're not feeling well after their seizure that they don't fight you too much about that. And that really can help bring down their temperature pretty good. All right, so status epilepticus is continuous repetitive seizures. They're greater than 30 minutes without recovering or regaining consciousness in between or a seizure that's over five minutes. So if they have a seizure and then they are in that postictal or recovery phase and they're not quite back to their baseline and they have another seizure and then they're not quite back to their baseline and they have another seizure, that is deemed status epilepticus. On the flip side of that, if they have a seizure and they have just one, but it lasts over five minutes long, then they will call it status epilepticus also. Um, a, B, C, Ds. D is like deficit. That's your neuro check. So if you have a child that comes in and they've had a seizure, um, you want to make sure you do your ABCs and a neuro check. Medications. Sorry, that's so loud. Renee's gate is going down. <laughs> okay, so there are emergency medications that they will give them. Um, Ativan is usually your, your front line. <coughs> Sorry, that's your lorazepam. That's often the first drug that they give to be able to stop a seizure. However, there's nasal versed. So EMTs might carry nasal Versed. Um, that way, if they can't get an IV in, they can still get some medication into this patient. Um, families might have buccal medications that they can tuck right back in their cheek. You wouldn't want to do that while they're seizing because their teeth are really clamped down. And if they grind at all, they can end up catching their finger. Um, so as soon as they stop, they can do that and slide that in their cheek. They can also... Um, give them suppositories that can help with seizures. Um, so nasal, buccal, oral, IV, and suppositories per rectal. So there's lots of different methods of delivery. Dextrose can actually help stop a seizure if they're very hypoglycemic. If they're way down there in their low 30s or something and they end up having a seizure, giving them dextrose 50%. Um, and just pushing that in there really quickly can bring their blood sugar up and can help stop that seizure. All right, for your seizure assessment, so you want to assess their respiratory effort. Um, are, they are they breathing at all? That little girl in the video we watched that was on the purple bedspread, she, you could hear her grunting. You could hear her um, kind of it was almost a whine a little bit, but kind of a grunt and a cry, um, trying to breathe some. Other times there's no sound and they're not trying to breathe at all um, or they're not able to because that diaphragm is locked down with, those, with that tonic um, muscle spasm 
kind of movement. Description of your seizure and your history. So you want to be able to tell your physician if their eyes were fluttering, rolling back in their head, if they were um, grinding their teeth, if they have their back arched, whatever it is about their seizure that's unique. And then their history. Do they have they had a history of seizures? Or is this new and a first one? Um, the onset. So you want to time this seizure. Um, you want to look quickly at the clock when you see a patient having a seizure. Just glance at the clock. And then um, as it ends, as soon as it ends, glance at the clock. And that will help you be able to tell the physician how long it's lasted. And they'll be able to deem if they're having trouble with status epilepticus or something, if it ends up being over the five minutes. Uh, their behavior before, during, and after. If their behavior before was unique, maybe they were clicking their tongue, maybe they had a muscle twitch in their arm, or they were blinking a lot, or their eyes rolled back, or something like that, um, that would kind of cue you in as to as far as an aura that they might have. Then what the seizures like during, and then what they're like after in that postictal or recovery phase. What the what the movement is that they have, any facial changes, eye movement, and any incontinence. So for a diagnosis, they'll do an EEG. That's where they hook all those leads up to their head and have all those wires. And a CCTV is closed circuit TV. Oh, <laughs> Brooke, patient seized in the ER and she screamed right before she seized. Yeah, sometimes they have very unique um, kinds of auras. <laughs> Um, a CCTV is closed circuit TV, and it is like a camera that is just for them. So this is um, a unique way of catching their movements along with their EEG. <laughs> I'm tired. That's okay, Brooke. Um, so when you hook up all these leads up here at the top and then run them out to an EEG machine, then they have a camera that's also on this back wall that's aimed at the patient so you can see the patient. And then there's a button that's in the room. Usually they should have a family member or somebody at the bedside if they can. As soon as they start to seize, they hit the button and the call light. So they hit the button for um, to make a mark on the EEG and the call light to have the nurse come. Um, they will watch when the a neurologist look at, back at the tape, they'll see where that tick mark is that marks the, the spot on the EEG where they start to have a seizure and they'll watch the camera and see what the child does. And then they'll be able to tell pretty close, pretty directly uh, where that seizure is coming from and that helps them with target medications. Some medications are a little more effective on different parts of the brain and so they don't all... Um, react the same. There aren't, they aren't as helpful in certain areas as others are. We would have, sorry, I'll go back to this a little note. When, um, when I worked on neural trauma at primaries, we would have uh, patients come in, I almost said students, but have students come in because they were sleep deprived. Go figure. We would have patients come in who maybe had been sleep deprived and had a seizure or had had good seizure control, and now they are possibly have outgrown their dose, or they're just not having good control, and they need to see um, what part of the brain these seizures are coming from. So they would bring them in, then hook them up like this, hook them up, put up the camera for the CCTV, and then we would do terribly mean things, like sleep deprive them, would keep them up till about midnight, and would wake them up at four, or five, and then you'd have an ornery screaming little kid all day long, no nap, no anything, and they would try to elicit a seizure. When they were doing this, they would generally stop their medications, um, cold turkey, to try and elicit a seizure. These are really dangerous things to do because often they quit breathing and you can cause status epilepticus 
that can um, really wreak havoc on them being um, or having them be at risk for an anoxic brain injury because they aren't breathing for um, during the seizure. So we would have um, kids come in and then parents would stay at the bedside and sometimes they would seize and seize and seize and we would end up having to give them Ativan and try and pull them, you know, many doses to try and pull them back out of it and then we'd load them back up with their medication. All right, nursing interventions. A number one, numero uno, right here. Let's see if I can draw an arrow with my little pointer here. There we go. Patient safety. You want to make sure that that patient is not going to get hurt. Um, I had a, a friend in seventh grade that had a seizure disorder and nobody really knew. But one day we were in drama practice after school and she was on the stage and she sat down. She kind of sat down really fast and she said, I'm going to have a seizure. Don't let me fall off the stage. And she laid down. And then she had this seizure, which surprised all of us. And so we just stood at the edge of the stage um, on the ground, stood at the edge of the stage. And while she had her seizure, we just made sure she didn't fall off the stage. Seizure precautions will be a way of keeping them safe. You want to make sure their bed is in the lowest position. You want to make sure all four side rails are up and padded. So when you pad those side rails, often they'll take a bath blanket and they'll put it around the edge of the bed or they'll lay it over the bed rails and tape it with like the plastic kind of surgical tape. And you'll just kind of run it like this around the rail and, and hold the bath blanket on there. If you have a unit that has people that have seizures often and not like a neurotrauma unit, then they will have these boards that are cut out with the handles. So they kind of... I can't ever tell <laughs> where my camera is. They'll fit right down in between the bed and the rails and they kind of come up kind of high where the rails are and they, and it's a board on one side and then cushion on the other and it'll slide right down in there and that will keep them safe from hitting the rails when they have a seizure. ABCs, always make sure that you lead off with your ABCs right after safety. Safety is first, then ABC. You always want to make sure you have oxygen, suction, bag, and mask at the bedside. I love that I can do this. <laughs> there we go. Oxygen, suction, bag, and mask. Um, those are three things you never want to be without when you have a patient that has a seizure disorder, or, or really any patient. If you have somebody that's being admitted to your unit, you're going to be the nurse. Um, double check that room. If you're the aide, help them out and double check that room and make sure that they have um, a couple methods of delivery for oxygenation, that they have suction and tubing and, and all that they need for that, and that the bag and mask is the appropriate size that's at the bedside. Start an IV as soon as possible because you may need it for access for emergency medications. If they are seizing, obviously you can't hold them still long enough to place an IV that puts them at risk for injury. And so you would have to use some of the other methods of delivery. Time it. Make sure that you look at the time. If you're off by, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds, that's not going to be um, a huge issue. If you start, if you get them to a safe position, lower them to the floor, and then you think to time it and you think to look at the clock, that's okay. Um, emergency medications, PRN. And so sometimes EMS will show up with those. Sometimes parents will have those. Um, if you're in a facility, then you'll have those on hand. And then reassure the parents. It's pretty scary, especially if they, it's a first time or if they, um, if it's a febrile seizure and they need to have some education and some comfort. So your pharmacologic interventions, so your emergency medications, I try to dovetail this pretty closely with pharmacology, where they give you a couple of a couple of names. There's a lot of them that are out there. Your benzodiazepine group or family of medications is where this lorazepam comes from. All of your PAM kinds of drugs are your benzodiazepines. And 
Um, this one is number one. Ativan is the one they use most commonly. These will help stop a seizure, um, but it also makes them very, very sleepy. And so in their recovery phase after, in their post phase, they can be even sleepier than they normally would have been if they've received that event. Home emergency medications can be given buccal, nasal, rectal, and there's a whole slew of them. There's a bunch. And some of them, like Dilantin, is one that needs to have a drug level done periodically to make sure that it is in a therapeutic range. Not all of them need to do that, but Dilantin is one of them. It's also called phenobarbital. Um, Long-term, depends on the seizure type. Oh, phenytoin. Phenobarbital. No, actually, I think I think I wrote that wrong. I will double check, but I think it's phenobarbital. I will look right here. Give me one second because I think I may have put the wrong one on there. Um, it's a barbiturate. It's not telling me. No, nope. I think phenytoin, actually. Phenytoin is dilantin. Thanks for giving me a second there with my brain cramp. <laughs> um, phenytoin is dilantin, but the dilantin levels will need to be drawn. And so that's one thing if they come into the ER and they say that they're on dilantin, and they've had a seizure, make sure that you help that physician remember to get an order for a level of that medication. And then the dosing can change per kilo. So make sure that you write down the dose, their home dose for your physician so that they can evaluate that. All right, non-pharmacological management. So a ketogenic diet, so kind of like the keto diet, only these kids aren't on that to lose weight. Um, they, somebody, somehow, somewhere, found that being on a ketogenic diet can change your seizure threshold. So this ketogenic diet is high fat, moderate protein, and low, low, or no carbs. When they very, very first start, often it's no carbs. And then they might progress to where they can have one here or there where it's like you can have two strawberries with lunch or you can have four grapes with dinner. Like it's super, super low carbs. Um, and then moderate protein. The high fat, they say cook everything in butter, um, use lots of oils, um, eat lots of eggs and bacon, all those things that that seem a little counterintuitive to a lot of different things that we suggest for a good diet. For the first 24 hours, they have to be NPO to start so that their body can go into ketosis. So when their blood sugar drops and cheese, oh, so much cheese, yes. Butter and bacon sounds good, <laughs> yeah. Butter, bacon, and cheese. Um, these patients have carbs that they're using for energy. If they go NPO, then the, the body uses up the carbs and then we'll start to burn fat. When it starts to burn fat, the side product or the byproducts um, are ketones. And you'll be able to monitor those ketones in their urine. So they will start to do urine dipstick tests every time they go to the bathroom. You can put this little um, paper that has different colors on it and you dip it into the urine and if it comes out a certain color, then it means that you have some ketones in there, whether they're moderate, whether they're small, or whether they're large, it will tell you on there based on the color. If they have ketones in their urine, then they are burning fat for energy. Then they're in ketosis. A third of these kids will be seizure free and a third will have decreased seizures, but they might still need some medication and a third will have no change or the diet is too hard. So you can imagine if you're 11 years old and you start having seizures and they want you to try this ketogenic diet and you're 11 and you've been eating just like 11 year olds eat, how hard that would be to try and just change to this very difficult diet. 
um, very hard to follow for, for kids. The more developmentally delayed they are, the easier it is to follow because they don't know that they're eating differently. They don't understand the differences in the diets. So you will have kids that are very developmentally delayed that might even have a feeding tube and they will be, it'll be easier for them to be on this diet. And we had um, a mom come in one time and her child was on the ketogenic diet. And she said, yep, I just put heavy whipping cream right in through their G-tube, right into their stomach. Sometimes I'll just melt butter and I'll just put butter in there. I was like, this sounds so terrible. But those were some of the, the high fat kinds of things that she would use. Um, but here are three specifics. The very interesting little differences, I guess, from other things that um, I heard a neurologist tell a family member, a couple tell family members several times, no oral suspensions like Tylenol, ibuprofen, because they have a lot of sugar in them. Um, no flavored chapstick, so like cherry chapstick or whatever, um, especially on little kids because little kids lick their lips. And um, you've got those mucous membranes right there that can absorb other byproducts from the chapstick or other things that are in there. And no sugar-free gum, sh but I should add with xylitol or sugar alcohols. So xylitol is a sugar alcohol that's in some sugar-free gums. And so if there is a sugar-free gum that doesn't have any sugar alcohols, then that might be okay. But some of the others do have that in there. So those are three kind of interesting things. So non-pharmacologic management also with the ketogenic diet, usually they've tried two or more medications and been unsuccessful. Either unsuccessful in stopping them at all or unsuccessful in doing more than just slowing them down or making them a little more infrequent they still don't have good seizure control. And they're most often over 12 months old. If they're over 12 months old, then they are, then they usually have a little better stores that they can use um, fat stores and they can maintain their blood sugar a little bit better. Another reason why they're NPO, or sorry, uh, when they're NPO the first 24 hours, they really need to be in the hospital so that they can be watched. If we're not giving them any carbs, we run the risk of dumping their blood sugar way too low. And so some kids might need just a smidge of, of carbs to keep their blood sugar just above where it needs to be and still keep them in ketosis. This part that's in red won't be tested on on our test, um, but I just wanted you to know that there's um, newer studies about different types of seizures and 74% of kids on ketogenic diet saw greater than 86% decrease in seizures. So that's a lot. Those are really big numbers. Um, but like I said, it's kind of a difficult diet. So it really just depends on if they can follow that or not. All right, so the post phase, I'll tell you a little bit about it, but I want to tell you how to care for it. Um, that's our presentation. They have a change in level of consciousness. They're very lethargic. They can be confused. They have a headache. They can have slurred speech. And sometimes, particularly adults or older teens, can be kind of combative. Little kids, not as much. I just haven't seen as many. Not that they don't ever happen, but just not as often as with adults and later teens. Um, but they're really kind of out of it, quote unquote. And it's difficult for them to start to focus and start to wake up. Okay, so we will have this tomorrow, so don't panic. I can't remember if it was Megan or Maya that had this one, but don't panic. <laughs> it's not right this minute. Usually it happens right about here. And um, and so I do know <laughs> that, that you're scheduled for tomorrow, so it's okay. Okay. And the other one, I think that's Maya. <laughs> so those will happen first thing tomorrow. Let's see. Let's go back here. So we will actually probably end right there just a few minutes early. And then we'll lead off with our student presentations tomorrow. So I'll do 
just a quick little set of announcements if we need, um, answer any questions from today, and then we'll start off with Megan and Maya. Do you guys have questions about the material so far that you, that's something that you've been thinking? I see Maddie madly typing and not. <laughs> All right. Um, if you guys don't have any questions for now, we'll end there and then I will meet up with you again at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, bright and early. Red eyed, bushy tail, right? Um, Maddie said, I'm related to the PowerPoint. Are there quizzes, participation points, or gr graded based on our score? Okay, let me see. But are the quizzes, participation points, graded based on our score? I'm not quite sure what you mean, Maddie. Um, maybe you can email me um, or text me what you mean, and I can answer that a little bit better. And then once we've formulated an answer, then I can make an announcement maybe tomorrow in class. Oh, there's a lot of you guys typing, so I'll just hang on a second. Some quizzes, Braden, like last semester? We've done our based on our overall score on how we did other quizzes we've done. Oh, okay. So those um, couple of little activity or quiz activity kind of things that you've done so far were, I think, were done or not done. But your quizzes that you have that are numbered that are on your course exam and outline on the right-hand side in green, they correspond with each unit those will be graded based on the answers. Let me just share my screen here quick. We'll go to, no, nope, we'll go to here. Okay, so if you look at the top of your module here at your course exam and outline, right over here on the right hand side, and it talks about your quizzes, and it'll say neuro quiz number one, sensory, respiratory. These quizzes here that are in green will be graded based on your answers. Does that help? Is that what you were asking? Okay. The neuro quiz had a question that I had a concern about. Oh, yeah, Maddie, feel free. Text me or email me, um, whichever. Okay. Alrighty, well then I'll meet up with you guys tomorrow morning. Love you, bye. Peace out.